Hello, Levi. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> Why so serious? <laughs> oh, we're just packed full of, of uh, serious moments tonight. So if one were wanting to find a, uh, a a beautiful coffee mug with an octopus on it, where would you recommend picking one up? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe at the Renaissance? Oh, so, you know, I've been missing out all these years. The Renaissance is... Uh, the Renaissance fairs. Yeah. I mean, it's going to the wrong ones. <laughs> I'm told they are a lot of fun. I haven't gone uh, to one probably... I think my my oldest son was like four. We like I dressed him up in knight's armor, and we got a, the like the Lord of the Rings toys were in the stores at the time for yeah. like Fellowship of the Ring. So they had the sword and sting, you know. He had a little helmet from Halloween, and um, we dressed him up, and he he fought all the cosplayers, you know. They would they see this little guy coming down. He's like three in his little set of armor, you know, that we made him, and uh, it was it was cute. He ended up on the cover of the uh, of the um, the next year on the cover of the what do you, what do you call it like the uh, the or oh, the book that you yeah. get when you buy your ticket yeah. whatever that whatever is that's called yeah. brochure Pro- no. uh, program program yeah yeah he yeah he he ended up on the cover of that so that was cool but otherwise just you know strange people at Renaissance Fairs taking pictures of my child no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Small price to pay to get yourself a uh, a hit octopus mug. Oh, the fame. (laughs) (laughs) Shut up, son. We're getting ourselves a mug today. Put on this costume. (laughs) It is it is quite nice. So it is it is a very nice mug. It was was a gift. And uh I'm gonna keep drinking from it. Well, I think the thing is the uh is it was the way it was fired. It's got the uh it's got the purples and the blues. So it's not just like a normal mug. Like somebody actually like, you know, pottery fire. Kind of a uh, what do you call it a um, um, aurora borealis feel yeah. yeah yeah and this makes good uh, audio podcasting material <laughs> oh yeah the people are going to tune into this episode and be like what the hell this has nothing to do with RPGs they're talking about the weirdest things I'm I'm out yeah just <laughs> so have to go this to will YouTube be your lowest rated episode that. yeah exactly ever. <laughs> I watched right. it I got a great retention rate up until like minute three it just plummets. <laughs> No, fair enough. Okay. Well, you got you got something coming up. Like not only is coming up, it is happening. I do. You um, do. You know, I, I stay pretty busy with the old Kickstarters, uh, and my latest one is called uh, Chainsaw Wizards, Hecatomb Creeps, and Other Ungodly Bastards. Okay. And it so, is a- so why don't we go through that again, step by step? So, what's the first right. one? <laughs> uh, Chainsaw Wizards. Formerly, Chainsaw Wizards. Formerly Chainsaw Warlocks. Okay. Change the zero hour to Chainsaw Wizards. Uh, was more appropriate. Oh, I thought maybe you wanted to be able to uh, sing uh, the Chainsaw Wizards to the song Pinball Wizard by The Who. Uh, I had never even... a Chainsaw been, Wizard. That's got to be me, a twist. Yeah, that's uh, that, 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 that a... That may be my go-to. <laughs> <laughs> and there is, there is a Chainsaw Wizard in the book. He is one of the one of the many villains that, we, that, that is uh, described therein. So is he... Uh, when you say Chainsaw Wizard... Is he a chainsaw that is animated into like a wizard, like a anthropomorphic chainsaw? Is it's a he... gobot? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Or, or, um... or, is he... <laughs> or is he a wizard whose domain is that of chainsaws, or does he just have like a chainsaw for a wrist or a hand? No, there's uh, none of that is correct. Uh... <laughs> 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 no, no, um, and. Um... It might not even be a he or a she. It might just be a thing. I don't know. I don't want to give too much away because he's a really cool villain. Uh, he's right there on the. I will say he's right there on the cover of the of the book. He's got the some programmer. great art on the inside by Adrian Landeros. Um, but it is it's a very unusual villain. Uh, think like one part Hellraiser, two parts Venom from uh, Spider Man, and then like one part that weird wig that Dr. Smith used to wear in uh, Lost in Space that would give him uh, the power of, of Hercules. Do you, is that is it too deep of a cut, maybe? It is. I know Dr. Smith. <laughs> I know Lost in Space. I think the last time I've, I, probably last time I've seen it, I was probably like 14 years old on a Sunday afternoon. Oh, man, my favorite moments in Lost in Space were always like the really, really silly ones. Um, 
so Dr. Smith, you know, he's this balding kind of, uh, you know, nebbish uh, doctor yeah. who was a big coward, you know. Um, but he finds this alien creature that looks like a hairpiece and he puts it on his head. And all of a sudden it fills him with bravery and like the strength of like Hercules. And he's walking around like a sword and sandals kind of guy. <laughs> so, uh, but it's parasitic. So he has to, you know, they're trying to get it off of his head. It's making him do like crazy things. But wow. Um, yeah, it's kind of a kind of a cool little little, little device, but it's so it's so just bonkers. It's like you know, let's snorting a rail of cocaine uh, and writing a a script, in, you know, in the middle of the night, kind of just insanity. So, um, yeah, that was my inspiration for for that. Okay, so we got we got the chainsaw <laughs> wizard covered. Check. What's the next one? Sure, uh, Hecatomb creeps. Hecta Hecatomb. I can't even say it. Hecatomb. He Hecatomb. Hecatomb. What the right. what the heck is a hecatomb? So way back in the in the days of the early days of Magic the Gathering, one of my favorite cards was this card called Hecatomb. Um and I didn't play long, only only for a couple of years. Um but a hecatomb is like a burial ground. It's like a like a warren, a warren of 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 um of bodies. Okay. So um you know, think like uh like a like a mound or like a like a burial field or like a, the catacombs underneath Paris, you know, the, that that kind of thing. Um so you know, when you say hecatomb creep, you're you're you know, I'm it's obviously edging towards something that you know scrabbles around in the dark or maybe an undead creature, you know, or or or, or some of that. And there are definitely some undead uh foes in this in this book. So that that all tracks. Okay. So we got the hecatomb creep. Hecatomb creeps. Creeps. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> and the third one. What's the third one? Uh, and other ungodly bastards. And um, other ungodly and bastards. Okay. Yeah. And that refers to, to, to a few. There's a there's an anti-paladin in the book who is um uh who's very very nefarious, like a, just kind of an unusual take on the on the on the anti-paladin uh Myth a little bit of a little bit of Kurgan from Highlander in there, um, a little bit classic villain, but then I kind of go off in a real weird direction with it. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, no surprise yeah, I, there. Yeah, um, as you want to do. And there's also like an Ur priest. So in, I want to say it was third edition, probably right around the time of like Book of Vile Darkness, there was a. Um, a prestige class called the Ur Priest, U R dash Priest, <clears throat> and it was kind of like an anti cleric, um, not an evil cleric, not a neutral cleric, but like an anti, like like um, despise the gods kind of kind of uh, personage, uh, and they drew their power from siphoning siphoning magic and abilities from um, other characters who believed uh, in the gods. So I kind of took that idea and kind of ran with it. So there's definitely a character. Um, uh, in the book that that follows that path next okay. of the eight curses oh, is his name he's a he's one of my favorites actually one of my favorite illustrations in the book and one of my favorite characters to, to have written for it so so our, it does. so how many so this this book is strictly a um i don't want to say a best year but it's a, it's a list of foes it's a list of of uh, boss types I'm, I'm i'm assuming each one well, not not all of them are bosses. There's uh so I wanted to make a book where it wasn't just about like all bunch of high level guys. I wanted to have foes that kind of really range from like a like a challenge rating of like one to twenty. You know, the twenty being the upper. Like there's a kaiju in there. There's a, a lich. There's um a couple other really high level threats. But I wanted to have some mid level threats, some upper high level, and then a bunch of lower level threats too. Um, just to kind of round out the whole book, because you know, you, every, you everybody starts out at level one, so you need you need interesting adversaries, you need right. foils and, and and villains that um, can't just mop the floor with you immediately, you know. No. So that was the that was the direction I went with that. Like, just really wanted a wide range. Um, so they're not necessarily like you know like thugs or mooks or like little dungeon jabronis. They're just like interesting villains that can challenge a first level or second third level party um you know maybe not head on directly but you know they're maybe they're part of something larger or 
they're interconnected with a, with a grander scheme, but there's something that you can face off against early on, you know, or at yeah, least meet, you know, and they can grow, they can grow with the players. Maybe they, uh-huh. they don't start out as villains yeah. and, uh, you know, maybe later on they become the villain. You, you, there's no telling. So we're saying I that, said it only gets which way. Villains should get XP too. They shouldn't be the only ones to not get the love, right? Man, when I was uh, DMing games a lot, I always made my my villains rise in power with uh, like even like if they like if they had a villain and he somehow lived and I knew I was going to bring him back later. Let's say he was fifth level. Well, the characters went off and you know they had a bunch of adventures and they came back eighth level. Well, he he came back. He's like ninth or tenth. You know, yeah, because um, he was off doing stuff too. You know, which is the the way it should be, I, in, in my opinion. But um, especially if you're like weaving in the narrative, but I think that's kind of common for most DMs to do that. So, um, well, I yeah. don't think we, we we never played anything that was sequential like that. So I, I think for us, we never nothing has ever driven around a plot. It was just adventures. <laughs> well, see, I had the the opposite. Like, um. Most of my gaming was all sequential, was all long campaigns and intertwined storylines and all this other stuff. That was most of of what I did for, you know, when I was doing the majority of of playing, you know, playing once or twice a week, sometimes three times a week. Um, it was really um, after all that that I kind of got into the modules. I got a chance to, you know, run through White Plume Mountain or one, run through Tomb of Horrors or any of that other stuff, so... Um, the guys they game with that they when they were the game masters of the DMs they were running sequential stuff which so I just learned from watching them I ran sequential stuff so. we we did for other things but we just never did for for D and D it was just I don't know we just had our we just it was probably the most treated like a game you know as far as like you know we would on our own sometimes or just a couple of people we would just run some characters through enough things to level up to a certain point. And then we have a whole bank of characters and then we'd have an adventure and we'd select which one of the, the whole portfolio that we would have. I mean, it was very, it was very much a, I don't know, like kind of like almost like probably not that much difference than kind of like, like if you could advance your cards and magic the gathering, you're kind of building a, a draft kind of thing. But uh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Like, no, um, I, I still like the sequential stuff, but like the, I, I get most of my gaming now, like um, either, in a playtest group online or mostly at cons, you know, I don't have a local game group that is steady. You know, I have some people that will um, come to the house once every two months and we'll sit, we'll all have the day off or it'd be a yeah, holiday or the something. The sun, the moon, the stars align. You're like, Hey, yeah, this we is all, we're all grown and have families and jobs and kids and soccer and Taekwondo and all that other stuff. So it's, it's hard to get there, but when we do, it's cool because we can sit down and play like a one shot, you know, and I just grab one of these zines that I, you know, that I like to get something from Jacob Hurst and boom, run it, you know. <clears throat> so, um, so yeah, that's where most of my gaming comes now. But I, I, I did come from the the, the storyline, long campaign, you know, the, again, the sequential stuff. So that's my background. How well, about you? <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, it's just been. Yeah, I don't know why. It's kind of interesting why different games are different for us, and some things we did, but uh, but um, but for the most part, no. But that's okay. Um, but my gaming, yes, my sad story is it's hard to get a. I'm having a hard time getting a group going, so so we'll see. As you get older, um, it gets harder, man. Less and less time. It <laughs> seems like the, the day the, the day winds out faster. Well, I think the thing too, it's like uh, it, it's right finding that right day because I think. It, it seems like only certain days really work out well and it's finding that right day that aligns for me for whatever reason it always seems like it no matter how much i try to do otherwise like say thursdays are the only days that work i don't know why that is in general but but right i think it may not align for anybody else so but anyway but enough of that of that uh, nonsense about my my <laughs> tales of woe um <laughs> because i'll just write more rpg stuff i guess instead and work out my <laughs> angst that way do it, do it. <laughs> more Madlands. Come on, bring it. Yeah, actually, I, I've got. I probably have. This is interesting. So I probably have probably about eighty-five percent of a rough draft written. I've got it in general, the layout mostly done. I need to go give to somebody to do some heavy <clears throat> editing and add some more content. But, sure. but, but, this is the thing. You're you're on the same road that I am. Um, 
you want to do you want to do what like five or six kickstarters a year yeah um that's that's the plan i mean i've yeah. I've, I've got like, like four and i've got four or like things already just waiting to go yeah so you you got all these things but you you know each kickstarter takes up like a six week slot of kickstarter and all the nonsense that goes along with it yeah. maybe two months yeah. you know and so you, you you know to go from six to seven is very very difficult you know it's just the, the timing so you really only have so many slots and oh, what yeah. do you put in those slots mm -hmm. well that kind of winds back around to this project because this project largely was finished like a year ago i want to say i started on it a year and a half ago with adrian um i gave him 20 initial adrian landeros is the artist he did the cover he did all the interior art but i gave him um 20 initial like sketch notes for for these villains and he uh was just knocking them out of the park boom 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 and i, I found like i was really enjoying this this project i was you know i was loving revisiting some of these villains that i that i had run previously um, and I'm just creating new ones and kind of going like going back to my 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 notebooks and saying, all right, well, this is where I keep all my ideas. Like, you know, I have stacks to these notebooks. Yeah. You know? Let me go in and mine these for some really cool stuff and see if I can like emerge things and twist things and turn tropes on their heads and just kind of kind of see what happens. And uh, so I got largely it was done like a year ago. You know, it was, you know, finished the initial draft before, you know, I had some friends look at it and contributors and whatnot, and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. Um, I had most of it done, but it was, I just had all this other stuff going on. Like I had Phylactery Omnibus, Phylactery 4, then Zine Quest rolls around, and I'm like, I he just, this is not the book for Zine Quest, like I need to do something there. I had um, Three Curses for Sister Saren that was, you know, in, the, in development, uh, and I was working with, with another author on that, so... I had my, my I had a promise to keep to him. So, um, you know, this has been hibernation. It's been sitting in the back of my mind, just just fermenting in my brain for like yeah. <laughs> all this time. So I'm really, really happy, really stoked to get it, uh, finally get it out and finally get it, you know, in, into into shape, you know, right. where people, people can see, you know, what I've been so excited about all this time. Yeah, but the thing is, too, it's like those slots are kind of precious when you don't have, you only have a certain okay. number. So the okay. question is, you know, what do I use those slots for? And and hate to get the true business, but it's like, what's my return for that slot? Like, you know, and that's where I'm like, I, I, it pretty, I did okay <laughs> last time. I, I'm wondering if I, I have this fear because i it's going to be a little more art heavy art's going to be a little more expensive this time which it should be um i'm just concerned about it being a break-even project well uh, that's the way an actual businessman would think i don't think like that at all unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah i just um you can tell by my projects they're, they're kind of all over the place it's really what i think is cool and what excites me the most to write it, um, that's how you go from like, oh, let me do a couple issues of Flactory. Let me do this, yeah. this module about giant kaiju in a, on an on a Isle of Dread kind of situation. Oh, and there's now there's an apocalyptic cult and there's all this other stuff going on. But now, hey, let's go over and do a book about um, retro science fiction. And then we'll switch over to, oh, I don't know, uh, Weird West, you know, kind of horror vibe. And then you know, right back into fantasy. And it's like, yeah, what I think. What is he doing those, over there? <laughs> yeah, well, but there's still a lot of it's still dealing with D and D, uh, or form of it, sure. except for the Wild West. Well, and the, right. the, the sci-fi one too. And the sci-fi one, yeah. So those two, I think, are different. But for the most part, you're kind of in the wheelhouses. There, you know, people love your your take on the the uh, the fun uh, takes on D and D stuff. Yeah. Well, that's what I like to do the most, anyways. But every now and then, I get a, like an itch to do something crazy. Like yeah. I got, I was talking about those projects that are that are already kind of booked. I've got a, I've got a horror one that's coming, like a horror zine. Um, I've got a. Um, when you uh, say horror, you, are you still talking about RPG? Or are you talking about something different? Uh, no RPGs. Okay, yeah. so what are you? Yeah. What system are you thinking about? Are you still doing? Is it going to be D and D style, but themed with horror? No, we'll be, be what we 
it won't be D and D style at all. It's a um, it's more of kind of like a black hack kind of thing, but like the, just as a loose framework. There's so much. It's more like honestly, it is more like Scandinavian horror. You know, I'm not from Scandinavia, but I'm a big fan of uh, of of that. Um, and then the one that I'm I'm hoping will release at Halloween is more like a true zine than it is like an RPG zine. There's, it's for sure an RPG zine, but it feels more like a uh, an old uh, issue of Famous Monsters of Filmland, you know, or an old like um, 80s horror zine with uh, movie reviews and like just odd articles. But it's it's very much Halloween themed, very much horror themed. Uh, but not in the kind like more like classic horror, like hammer horror, like less, you know, more like um, tales, uh, like tales of suspense or house of mystery or right, you know, more more right. along those lines than, than anything else. And I've got a, a, several of my buddies have have helped create some cool stuff in there. Joy Royale and uh, John McGuire from Vintage RPG. My long, long time best friend um, Lawrence Hernandez has done some some cool stuff and. A couple other folks. So um, I'm just excited for that one to come out because it really is a hodgepodge of coolness, you know. But anyways, uh, the point I was making was that, you know, I'm, if, if I was if, if I was really trying to to make money, I would uh, go forth with my, my own system and, and do it from there. And then everything would be hinged off that system, you know. But I don't want to do that right now. I have a system. I have things that I play all the time uh, and work on all the time. But like. It's not ready for for mass consumption yet. Maybe one day it will be. Right now, I just really enjoy making cool adventures and zines that I would want to read. So the whole thing about, you know, the slot and the time and do I get a return for my investment? That's not really at the forefront of my of of my uh, reason for doing any of this. Yeah, I think uh, it it. For me, I've, what I would like to do is, if it's possible, is to retire from my day job. That'd be great. So you know, that is for all real. Of us. <laughs> huh? It's a dream for all of us. Yeah, so there's a certain amount per year I would like to hit. Sure. If, and if that triggers, then that's a reasonable choice for me to make. Yeah, no, absolutely. Especially as we get older, you know, you you start looking for what can I do in my retirement? Like, what can I do not only to stay busy, but help keep stuff coming in, um, engage my creative process? Because I don't yes. know about you, but like, if I'm, if I'm not doing something to be creative, like, it, it really tanks my mood. Like, I need something to, you know, it's, it's a big factor in my, I think, in my day to day happiness is the ability to create things. If even just for myself, you know, even if my, for my own enjoyment or, or just for that mental exercise of, of making something cool. Um, yeah, I, I, I need that, you know, so this we is can't great... get off that creative hamster wheel. We're stuck on that hamster wheel. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, even in the years where I wasn't playing Dungeons and Dragons or, or RPGs at all, I was still reading them, you know, because I enjoyed reading them. Um, and I was still like making notes and writing things in notebooks and um just little ideas and snippets of things and i you know, sometimes i'd write a, a little bit of prose or whatever but you know yeah. nothing you know i can read it now and i groan because it's so bad but like i always had that that um that engagement with with like trying to be creative you know what i mean oh yeah no likewise because that's what we're going to do it's it's kind of like uh Someone says that, you know, we don't uh, write songs because the world needs more songs. We write more songs because we need to write more songs. You know, it's this. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's not like my stuff is like going in the vault for, you know, when there's a nuclear war and, oh, we got to pull out the the creative genius. You know, no, no, just it's just games and, you know, not 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 the greatest of games. If you're if you're being frank, you know, like it's (laughs) it's not like I said, it's, it's it's not the. You know, we're not we're the the the, uh, the the ape men in in you know five hundred thousand years aren't going to be holding it up. You know, on the ruins, going ook, 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 you know, they're not going to be holding up a copy of Big Eye Chungus. You know, well, like... no, wait a minute. Now, okay, now what I think you need to do is in the future write a post apocalyptic where the ape men do get the Big Eye Chungus, and because they get the, they start a cult, a doomsday cult. Of apes around Big Eye Chungus. 
you know, man, uh, for whatever reason, that reminds me of this really um, interesting storyline in the 80s. Did you ever read? So you were you 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 a comic guy? Oh yeah. Okay. Did you ever read Timothy Truman's uh, Scout? Comics? Yes, but I think the problem is, <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna do a confession. A friend really loved it for some reason. I did read it. I never really got into it, and I don't know why. Well, going back to what we were talking about, this I mean, as far as the connection, uh, what made me think of this was. There was a storyline in, in Scout where there was this blind prophet who uh, was trekking with his cult across the wastelands, but he had he had a, like a partial copy of the Bible and a partial copy of Lord of the Rings, and he had merged them together into this narrative and was preaching, um, you know, this kind of crazy gospel where you know, like the Savior was you know Gandalf and you know, all this stuff, the evil, the One Ring, and there was sorrow and whatnot. And to me at that time, like I was like 14 or I don't know, 15 or something when I first read that, I thought, man, that's a cool narrative. Like what, what a, I would never have ever conceived of anything like that. So um, that's a little off topic, but man, like if, if you get a chance, go back and, and read those issues of Scout, man, because that was a really, uh, and Truman's a genius anyways, and then just with his art, but like his, the, the stuff that he wrote for that, him and John Ostrander doing uh, Grimjack too, just great stuff. Um yeah, and I wow. think too, it's really off topic. <laughs> yeah, I think we're different ages. I think for whatever reasons, you know, it's no different than things we loved when we were younger. We look back and like this was terrible, and likewise, things we didn't like when we were younger. Now we're like, wow, this is really pretty amazing. And so we right. do changes people. Yeah, I'll have to give that a chance. Now, I'm now I want to uh, apply. Now you said this, I want to go to Chat GPT and see if I can ask it to create a theology by mixing two things together. I wonder if it'll do. Yeah, that. no, absolutely. I mean, Chat GPT is going to be the end of us all, anyways. <laughs> Skynet, here we come. At least I'll, um, I'll be the first one to have the uh, Lord of the Rings Bible. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be that blind prophet walking across the <laughs> desert with your with, with your crook and your followers. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening. It's coming. It's happening. Yeah, Jeffrey coming, Jones, prophet, coming soon to a apocalypse near you. Okay, well, I think we need to do it. I think we need to do the arena of death. Oh, okay. <clears throat> uh, we'll call it the arena of death. Okay, are you ready for the arena of death? <laughs> Is this where um, you pit uh, a few of your uh, trusty player characters against oh, some of the villains yes. from this book? Yes, we are going to <laughs> test out these bad boys that, that, that you've written up, Levi. We are going to put them to the full test. We've got right. four different um, baddies, and I've got four different characters that I've, <laughs> I've pulled out from my vault, my most treasured and beloved characters from my youth. <laughs> you wouldn't kill them, would you, Levi? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> okay. I really am not a killer DM. I, I think it's maybe why um, sometimes... I get the sour look at DCC tables because I'm I, I really not. I mean, I have, I, don't get me wrong. I've killed plenty of player characters over the years, but um, I'm really not like a, you know. No. I'm not that guy, but <laughs> but that may change today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I got my <clears throat> I got my first character who's a fighter. His name is Fightor. Fightor. Oh, in, in He-Man, Masters of the Universe uh, style right there. Yes, exactly. Very Fight shorts tour. and a harness. Yeah. Fight tour. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so who's, who's he facing up against? Well, I don't know. I sent you uh, I sent you four mm -hmm. illustrations. You pop one of those up and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see what I can do. We'll, we'll <laughs> randomly roll. We'll randomly roll for Fightor. <laughs> I'm hoping for the, it looks like a Kenku. I'm hoping for the Kenku. I think you might be able to handle the Kenku. Uh, ooh, I rolled the Kenku. Okay. okay. So there is a, a, a Kenku uh, villain in this book. His, uh, sorry, her name is. Oh, now uh, I feel bad. <laughs> no, not at all. Okay. Her name is uh, Anzu the Blackwing. Now I'm starting to like this bad person. <laughs> Anzu the Blackwing. She was born into a very cr uh, life of cruel servitude. Uh, her and her Kenku brethren and endured horrible treatment at the hands of a like a human warlord uh, but she was rescued by the cult of pazuzu when Pazuzu's. they when they pretty much wiped 
Pazuzu, the uh, the Lord of the Upper Air, the the Demon Lord, who was also kind of has a bird visage, not the Exorcist, not the one from the Exorcist, the one from D and D. Um, yeah, so she became an agent of the, the uh, of the cult of Pazuzu, and um, and has become an assassin. Oh, ooh, okay. Very now I have, I have a reason. Okay. <laughs> So let's see. Um, there was an abandoned castle um, that was somehow untethered, set adrift, and came floating over the city that you were in. Uh, you and your uh, your companions were uh, either wanted to be the first to loot it, <laughs> or uh, were sent by agents of uh, of some sort of you know benign and good cause, maybe a, a, a church or a, oh I don't know, maybe the government uh, of that particular city. Uh, you know they they. You know, they sent you up there to to, to check it out. I think you know, I think Fighter just wants vengeance for the Kenku killing somebody beloved to him. Oh, done, done. So yeah, uh, but uh, you know, listen, Anzu the Blackwing and her uh, her her agents have also been uh, dispatched by, by the cult of Pazuzu to uh, to you know seize the castle and, and and lay claim to it. As you know, Pazuzu is the Lord of the Upper Air, and here comes a, flo- a floating castle. Uh, what more could be a sign? So, there in the uh, the the crumbling ruins of a of a of a floating castle above, you know, in the clouds, far above the uh, the, the city. Um, there you are. There I am. Yep. Let's do it. I'm ready to throw down. Are we rolling uh, dice? Oh okay. yeah. Hey, look! I'll uh, get out my. Uh, oh no, coins. that's a bad omen there. <laughs> Let's see what I got here. All right. Okay. Um, done. Today tonight we'll use uh, Jim Wampler's mutant murder hobo dice. Oh my goodness. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So initiative. Yeah. Sure. I roll through that. Let's just uh, let's just make it simple and roll a d6. Okay. High number wins. Five. And you're doing like a your character is like a OSR retro clone kind of character, right? But yes. Okay, not a five E. All right, done. Okay. Hey, do we have a picture of uh of Anzu the Blackwing up? So everybody can see her. Oh, now you're glory. now you're now you're uh calling on me to <laughs> uh this is these are skills that I don't know that I've got. <laughs> I don't know if I can I guess I could sh- screen share. Sure. Okay. Or and do avatars i don't know i guess i was less prepared than i thought i was see you know i spring stuff on you now you're springing stuff on me i don't know if that's the way it's supposed to be waiting i know i know i got i got (laughs) the copy image save to downloads downloads This is riveting gameplay for those. It is riveting, (laughs) riveting. Um, I guess I will uh, share screen. See what this does. Hey, there she is. All right. Well, Anzu the Black Women. All right. So, what did you roll for initiative? I rolled a five. I rolled a seven. Oh, there's no. a bonus. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So she uh, cocks back her bow and shoots an arrow at you. Let's see if she hits. What's your armor class? My I'm wearing chainmail. Okay. So what is that? That's a uh, got any kind of dex bonus or a shield? Uh, he's got no shield, no dex bonus. He's not that good. So what is that? Six. Sure. All right, that is definitely a hit. Go ahead, and make me a saving throw minus two versus magic. <laughs> minus two puts me at zero. So you roll a zero? I rolled a two, but minus two equals zero. Oh, sure. So that arrow of human slaying strikes you dead. <laughs> Next. <laughs> <laughs> so are we doing the, the characters against this one baddie, or are we doing one character versus each baddie? Oh, we'll do one character versus each. Nobody wants to sit through hours. Okay, and- I just want to make yeah. sure. Okay, so uh, <laughs> the arrow of human slaying, uh, yeah, it 
It did not get far. We the next will be no. I, so I'm just saying, like this is a high level assassin. You know, this is a no. You know, you're probably running around with like a first level fighter or something. So uh, who knows? No, he's actually twentieth level. I had uh, him. Is my first fighter ever. I was a child. And I rolled him <laughs> up. Was... Oh well, I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> <laughs> now. <Fair enough>. <laughs> No. At least we don't have to roll for that, like first edition, uh, you know, the assassination attempts, or we don't have to deal with any of the poison or the stepping in and out of shadows, and uh, we, we don't have to deal with any of that. We can just move right on to the next one, which is your choice, dealer's choice. Which one do you want? We will do. Um, we will do um, the spider guy. Oh, <laughs> that's Gorgoth, the dream spider. Gorgoth, the dream spider. Yeah, the dream spider. <clears throat> also known as the demon spider. Okay, I've got the wizard Theremin. Ooh, okay. Ooh. Cool, cool. Okay. And so, people listening, I don't know anything about any of the characters he's running. He doesn't know anything about any of the, <laughs> any of the monsters or <laughs> villains that I'm running. So, this is, we're just winging it. Um, all right, yeah. So, uh, let's set the stage. Um, okay. So, Gorgoth the Dream Spider. One part old wives' tale, one part demon, and one part extra planar horror. Mm. Gorgoth skittered out of some dark cyclopean vault between the very frames of reality and set its sights on devouring the sleeping dreams of the mortal world. All right. How's that for a weird villain for you? That All is right. a weird villain. Let's set our stage here with a plot hook. A horrible sleeping sickness has overtaken a small hamlet on the edge of the frontier. Contrary to most of their afflictions, it seems to affect only one victim at a time, steadily weakening their bodies until they die before moving on to another altogether. Okay, so uh, all herbal remedies have failed. Local clerics are hard-pressed to explain what's happening. Everybody's at a loss. Okay. Um, can you help the folk of this small frontier town discover what is truly happening? before the sickness overtakes everyone and can you do that before you too fall under its sway i am certain that theremin the wizard can do that <clears throat> theremin all right so uh yeah you're standing uh over this uh this person who is wasting away in their sleep they can't wake um every day they grow weaker um i they're... shake him i shake this person like william shatner shaking somebody it's all messed up like wake up wake up <laughs> Yeah, not awakening, not mm. awakening. But just for the sake of speeding this along, um, we'll go ahead and give me a strength check. Ooh. <laughs> Do I, you gotta, I have to roll less than my strength? Yes. Yeah, I made it. Equal to or less. Okay. So, um, yeah, a, uh, an unseen but very, like, potent force uh, shoves you back. Like, normally... Uh, Maybe if you hadn't felt it coming or you hadn't been had gotten that split second awareness before it hit, you feel like you'd have been thrown against the wall like a, you know, like a like a like a possessing force. Like you know, you've seen like in um, you know, The Exorcist or those kind of movies like a thousand times. Uh but yeah, you stand your ground and just slide back like a, a foot or two, making big grooves in the sand as you uh as you do. I'm right now I'm doing better than than uh Phytor. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Poor Phytor. Uh, if only we knew you. Yeah. Alas. <laughs> yes, yeah, so what do you do? Okay, so I see this creature, you said? Oh, you don't see anything. Oh. Yeah, you um, just pushed I, back I by an unseen I force. will speak out, uh, show yourself, foul being. Yeah, nothing. Um, you just had this, again, you had been, been you grabbed the, the, this poor sleeping person you know by the shoulders and was shaking them mm. uh but once you cease doing that you know the sign i i look at the person laying there see if their eyes are doing anything crazy no they're just uh they're out i mean their guys are closed they're asleep you know just oh. effect, effectively um however you know being a the high level wizard you are um you know you're getting a feeling here that there's definitely something unseen happening um maybe even that this whatever possessing force is here is not even on the same plane as you oh that's that's a problem uh is it, is it a wizard <laughs> so I, I have a feeling magic missile is not gonna do me any good 
you can odd this player agency, man. You do what you want to do. Yeah, I'll get one shot with that. <laughs> um, I will um I know what I'll do. I will try and take a nap, see if I can reach to it through through sleep. Uh okay. Um yeah, um, so remember what you heard that a horrible sleeping sickness had overtaken the the hamlet. And that uh, contrary to most other afflictions, it seemed to only affect one victim at a time. They would weaken their bodies until they died and then move on to somebody else. So really, I need to kill the guy before he would go move on to me. But, but think, maybe that's there's a connection. If you, uh, if you, uh, that's up to you, murderer. I think what I'll do is I will lay down next to the guy and uh, as it gets to be evening, see if it just appears in the evening. Maybe it appears. No, no, he's, he's, he's sweaty, though. He's real sweaty. Oh, that's gross. Yeah, he's not uh, not doing well. And as the night passes, he uh, he grows even even, even worse. He, um, he's barely breathing, very shallow. I mean, you just feel like the life is just being leached out of this this poor guy. He groans every now and then. He he sighs. Uh, very unrestful sleep. Sometimes he cries out. <laughs> it's actually very tragic to behold. <laughs> yes, I feel really bad. I, I I came here telling everybody I had the the promise of fixing this situation, and that through my foul magics I will I will scream out to this creature. Show yourself, coward! Show yourself. I'm, I'm envisioning you like um like Michael Scott in the office when he cooks his foot on his foreman grill, <laughs> and then uh, they end up taking Dwight to the hospital later, and, he, and he's trying to put his foot in the MRI machine. <laughs> That's kind of how I'm envisioning your wizard right now. Yes. No, no, nothing. Like uh, nothing, nothing happens except this guy is just getting sicker and sicker. By the way, this is a very high level uh, threat that you're, you know, oh. just between you and I. So okay. there may be nothing you could do. The cleric might have might have been able to do something, but I thought I'd get him. Maybe I'd get him on a horse and try and get him out of there. Maybe it's maybe out of the town. Maybe that's it's it's maybe it's <laughs> connected to the town. Hey, you know, give me. Uh, I don't know. Zero. High, what, what level wizard are you? High I'm level? first. I'm first level. Oh, first level, okay. <laughs> um, ah, <laughs> <well>. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's magic fast missile. forward. Yeah, we'll fast we'll fast forward through this a bit. Uh, days go by. This 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 poor soul dies. Uh, you can't figure it out either. Um, we'll stay on a roll. I'll roll this d twenty on a roll of one. It chooses you. It's a roll of a two. It did not choose you. Just yeah, it chose just, somebody just... close to me that I love, and I get to watch them wither and die. Yeah, just a couple days later, somebody else uh, begins, you know, has a, the sleeping sickness, and it begins all over again. And you know, folks are weeping, and you know, well done, hero. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so it, it, there's there's not a whole lot we can do here. Again, this is meant for a, a higher level, um, and really, really for uh, kind of you know, th there would there would be more exposition for this. Um, so really, I just. Okay, well, I I leave the town and I never go back and I never. <laughs> no, Gor Gorgoth feeds on dreams uh, and converts them in the, into nightmares. Now, if you he's an ethereal creature, you can't even reach him from the prime material plane unless yeah. you have the means to either get there or or force him to to show him. So that's where the higher level stuff comes in. Um, he's just one of those terrible, you know, um, like a night hag, you know, or a possessing demon. You know, he's a, a force that you have to call in. The, you know the experts for okay well, i know. guess i assumed i was the expert but at first level i guess not expert yeah. enough no and listen if we were playing this like just sitting down to play this uh long term you know i might we, we you know there'd be a, a quest to go find out some information or you know you'd yeah maybe yeah. run into some npcs or either there'd be a series of events that you know i wouldn't just strand you yeah but by the time but, you go back half the population's dead <laughs> this is rapid fire though <laughs> uh but one of the cool things that gorgoth does is that if you when you encounter him on the on the ethereal plane he's, he's fairly weak as far as like for, for the, the the level of the of the characters that would be encountering him however he can convert um these dreams and nightmares into or so these dreams into, into like physical nightmares so basically it's a he can unleash a a monster summoning the, uh, from from the devoured dreams that you'll have to face when you face before you can face him on the on the ethereal plane, um, you know. So the sponsor summoning being he's bringing these nightmares to life. Okay. Um, so that's just and it, the, he has telekinesis and a few other you know, little nifty things that that help him survive. But um, you know that's the that's the thing. He's just this awful malicious creature that that preys on uh, preys on the weak. 
you know. Um, so it's a little part monster, but um, you know, in in the book, there's uh, some plot hooks and there's some motivations and lore that kind of take it beyond him just being just some just another monster. I mean, he has some cool he has the cool ability of being able to turn your dreams into living nightmares. But um, you know, aside from that, um, there's some hooks that can that, that you know that you can extrapolate on as a as a DM um, and do different things with. Okay, so we'll do we'll do the next one. Ooh, who's it gonna be? It's the guy who looks like he's got hands coming out of his clothing. Oh, no, this is a high level threat. So, this is one of those those ones I was we were talking about before we we, we got on. Um, that's a threat. So, so so pick a pick a character that you know might uh, might have <laughs> the ability to actually take this guy on. <clears throat> okay, I pick Pius the cleric. Pious the cleric. Ah, oh, alas. Um, all right. So this is Nanthos of the Whispering Shadow. Now, people who have bought, uh, have read a lot or bought a lot of Planet X stuff will notice that I've, I've actually talked about this guy a time or two in the past. I've mean, seated him into issues of the phylactery. He was um, um, a key, uh, the key component of one of the one of the items in magic and shit. Um, yeah. He, so he's he's got a there's a there's a uh, a precedent set for him as you know being this uh, you know evil sorcerer of shadow. All right, sounds good. All right, let's see here. All right, so um, Nanthos, uh, he was a sorcerer of uh, you know considerable magical might. Like he was the the you know the, the kind of evil being that you know lived along these like kind of desolate wasteland ziggurats out in the middle of the desert that were half buried by the by the shifting sands he's one of those uh kind of lovecraftian um sorcerers you know that was already half insane you know he's you know scribing spells from demonic voices on the wind that that kind of like you know that, that kind of character um but uh, you know, he sought out this dark. I'm not, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but he sought out this uh, this dark lore. He discovered a trove of knowledge in an ancient ancient ruin um, that led him to the plane of shadow. So he departs for the plane of shadow and doesn't come back for a long time. But when he does, he comes back. He's very changed, and his whole mindset about things is is also changed. Um, so what exactly he discovered there is unknown. But when he returned, he's got this ravaged mind. His his body is weak, but he's kind of become one with the the fabric of night you know he's a he's a creature uh that is at least in part partially composed of shadow you know he's if you could, you could tell from the um from the uh the illustration you know that he's he's got all these kind of like lurking wisps of, of shadow that kind of like you reach out and you know kind of go across his body and uh, you can't tell like what's real and what's shadow it all kind of merges together so uh, so a sorcerer, or uh, you know, in in uh, OSR retro clone terms, a wizard of uh, considerable might. So uh, let's set the stage. Where is uh, where the where does this go down? Let's say um, uh, so. There's a local desert settlement, and uh, rumors are abounding of of uh, the locals. Their shadows are are coming to life. Some of the shadows will are, are throttling their owners. Uh, some of the sh shadows are just running out of town. Some shadows just disappear altogether. Um, but all omens and portents kind of kind of point towards this this ruin out in the uh, in the shifting desert that's kind of half swallowed up by the sands. And uh, one of the town's guard even claims to have seen like man shaped shadows like creeping across the sand uh, in the waning dark, just to kind of uh, you know headed in that direction. So um, you know. Does something lurk in those uh, those those uh, crumbling ruins still? Is uh, you know why is it drawing the the town folk's shadows to it? So your character Pius the cleric, <laughs> he ends up uh, he, he he comes to the ruins and he comes face to face with uh, with Nanthos of the Whispering Shadow. Nanthos, okay, Nanthos. yeah, and okay. uh, you know the, the 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 two of you face. We'll just do this simply. The two okay. of you. Okay. What are you, what are you doing? Um, I think I'm going to. That's a good question. I guess what I guess what what D and D system are we using here? 
like um, let's just say like first edition or any kind of retro clone okay. of the uh, the you know the old the old school. Okay, so I, I've matter. got my um, uh, so a protection from magic. How about that? Or protection from evil? <clears throat> sure. Does it buff me up? Does it give me any bonuses, or is it just a waste of time? You mean the protection of magic, the like the scroll, or protection from evil? Yeah. Oh, protection from evil. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so we would need to roll uh, initiative. Okay, let's do it. Roll with that dead trusted V six. I got another six. I got a one. Um. Yeah. So you just uh. So you see this be this. You know, you see the picture of him there. He's just yeah. kind of grinning at you in a sort of half insane way. Seems like he's muttering to himself. And you see literally the shadows of the uh of the the ruins. They they literally kind of lay down. And they start just crawling towards you, and in, and in those shadows you see, you know, hands and claws and eyes materializing, and they uh, they advance they advance towards you as he kind of you that's know, pretty creepy speaks to himself. Hmm. That's all he's doing. Yeah, yeah. He's just oh. like I said, he's talking to himself, and the, the shadows are are advancing towards you. That's that that was his action. Uh yeah. I would say the um, well, this doesn't look good for me. Oh yeah, so you're a cleric, high level cleric, I take it. Uh -huh. I don't know. I can be. Well, yeah. Well, let's just say you're a high level cleric because this is a high level foe. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, you see the shadows lurking. Yeah, those are definitely undead creatures. Uh, they come. You see the eyes, and you just feel the. You feel the everything. Everything that is wrong about an undead creature that that is anathema to life, that is unnatural. You sense that in these shadows that are creeping. Oh. You. Um, so I can sense that these are undead. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I, I, I I'm going to try. Um, I'm going to try turn undead. Yeah, absolutely. So you change your action. You throw up your uh, yeah. your your holy symbol. Blinding white light, you know, comes out of it. You say your your prayers or curses or whatever it have you, depending on your alignment. Uh, and yeah, you, you banish these shadows. Like at a high level cleric, and banish shadows pretty easy. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, you just literally just uh, your force meet your force of light meets his force of darkness, and they they obliterate each other. Uh, now you've got his attention. He's very uh, his the eyebrow cocks up. You know, oh, yeah. uh, he stops muttering to himself, and um, I tell him it's not too late. He can he can just he can he can change his life for the better. Uh, yeah, so he casts uh, Abby Dalzim's horrid wilting at you. Are you familiar with the spell? No. <laughs> Make a saving throw <laughs> versus the spell. I fail. So Abby Dalzim's horde wilting is a so it, he's thinking in his head. He's thinking like, well, anybody that has the power to to banish, you know, whatever forty shadows <laughs> that I've just conjured to to give myself another minion, it's pretty powerful. I better blast him with a with a a, a fairly potent spell. So it's an eighth level spell. Um, it basically sucks the moisture out of your body and leaves you a uh, a uh, a husk. So I guess is there opportunity for uh, rehydration later on if you survive? Uh, but it's a D eight per level. Um, and I, I don't remember where it, I don't have it in front of me, but it caps out at a start, maybe like fifteen or something. It caps out. I don't remember, but so. If you can survive 15 D8 of damage with uh, having failed to save, then uh, go for it. What do you do? I, I failed to save. Oh, uh, we'll just say that you are just terribly, terribly hurt. You're down to a few hit points. Oh. Um, um, He's incredibly uh, surprised to see that you're, you're, you're still alive. I, um, I, I take a drink from my flask and I spit at him. How's that sound? <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, all right. Well, man, now I just feel like I'm just murdering you. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, man, there's like a thousand things you can do. Um, you're, 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 uh, low, low on hit points. You're, you're fuming. You're, you're, uh, the gas tank's almost empty there. Um, yes. Do you, do you want to do anything else before I go? I'll do a, I'll do a flame strike. How's that sound? Hey, flame strike. All right. That's a good spell. I wish I had the holy hand grenade. The holy hand grenade. All right. But I don't. Flame, you, you flame strike him. Boom. Yeah. What levels? What levels flame strike? That's a uh... fifth level. Okay, that's good. So his minor globe of invulnerability does not uh, take care of that. The shield spell he had does not take care of that. Stone skin. 
All these spells that he was casting when he was detecting you were coming coming close do not help. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, the flames he failed to save, the flame strike ravages his body. Um, even as uh, you can tell that it doesn't do as much damage as it should have done, but it's still, you know, it still ravages him really, really bad. Crawls all over him. You see the, all the shadowy bits that you know they're, they're like uh, like sizzling and evaporating off of his body. Um, he just screams in like a just a, a snarl, just a, a you know terrible um, snarl. His next action would be to uh, uh, he steps into the, the nearby shadow and disappears. Oh, hmm. I scared him off. I dust myself off. Consider it a good day. <laughs> but again, yeah, the, we're, we're we're talking. This is just uh, you know pure tactics and dice. You know, we're not, we're not getting into the motivations or the um, you know the the, the who's or the whys or, no. or, or whatnot. You know, villains should be able to be defeated. So you know, I wouldn't say that he was he, he wasn't killed, but you definitely drove him. You surprised him and, and drove him away. So I scared him off. Good on you. Yeah. <laughs> I scared him off. All right. So last but not least, uh, Stank the Thief. Stank the Thief. Oh, and then that's, uh, we're doing, uh, the next is. Uh, uh, it's like the, the, the Headless Horseman, but with a head. Oh, Other she's not like, a Headless Horseman. <laughs> no, but with a head. That is Holantra Hell Eyes. <laughs> yeah, the Butcher of uh, Brunwald. Okay. The Butcher yeah. of Brunwald. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let Her me... motto is the highway of fear is the shortest route to defeat. <laughs> if you look at that, uh, if, you, if you look at that illustration, um, you'll see that, you know, she has this, uh, like some, some color around her eyes and uh, she's crying blood. Like, literally, oh. there's just streaks of gore that are coming out of her eyes. She has her eyes and her eyes are like a pale yellow, but uh, her tears are blood. Oh, so that's kind of gross. Yeah, she's astride her her uh, pale albino mount. You know, she's a blackguard of the highest order. She's a, a, a you know just basically a renegade fallen paladin. Um, oh, she rides a pale serves... horse. What's that? Uh, she rides a pale horse. She rides do, a pale horse. Do you ever read what? the Piers Anthony on a pale horse? Well done, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Um, <laughs> She serves the dread god Chernabog, which is like if you were to equate Chernabog to a deity that everyone knows, it would be like um, like Bane in uh, the Forgotten Realms, like oh, a, okay. uh, a, okay. a, a a a god of tyranny and um, and power and um, and hatred. You know, everything you would think that would embody the word Bane. It's yeah, that... strife, strife and tyranny. You know. Um, she was originally a paladin in service to the forces of good, as all paladins are. Uh, her entire band of companions were lured away from the light after an unsuccessful crusade on the foul plain of Gehenna, uh, which resulted in both of them, uh, most of them being slain or damned to imprisonment there. Hmm. After, after her return to the mortal plane, her downfall continued and, uh, you know, basically culminated in her being recruited into or enlisted into the ranks of, uh, you know, Chernabog's faithful. All right. So this uh, this starts out our plot hook. I got a couple here we can choose from. Um, let's see. Everyone from local lords to the royal crown is dismayed at reports of raiding and pillaging by outlander barbarians along the western border. In the past, these attacks have been few and far between, never in such a consistent and organized manner. Rumors of a terrible figure clad all in black, helm alight with flaming eyes astride a massive <clears throat> pale steed have begun to circulate, and with them come even worse tales of savagery on the battlefield. Mm. You are dispatched to seek out this mysterious new leader and end her rampage of destruction. If you fail, doom may very well befall the entire kingdom. That's up to me, Stank the Thief, to save the kingdom. <laughs> oh, poor Stank. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she's one of those more like mid-level, like mid, um, mid-level threats. You know, like uh, not quite for the, your first and third level characters, but not quite for your fifteenth to twentieth. Somewhere okay. there in the middle. Okay, that's too bad I brought a third level thief, but we'll see how it works out. 
<laughs> yeah, you uh so yeah, you managed with your third level thief. Uh you managed to follow the destruction and find Halantra and her uh her horde of not horde, it's just really just a ragtag group of like a hundred, you know, uh savage barbarian types, you know, they've come from the hinterlands and followed her down. Um yeah, you find them encamped at night. You wait till night. You sneak into the, you sneak into their encampment with one, uh, with one goal is, is is putting Halantra out of her out of her misery. Yeah, out of our misery. <laughs> so what'll it be? Okay, I'm gonna sneak up and I'm gonna try and and uh, stabby stabby with my short sword while she's asleep. Sure, sure. Um, while she's asleep. All right. Well. Or if I can't get her sleep, at least in a in a, in a in an opportunistic way. Yeah, there's the uh, so her her pale horse is you know tethered directly outside of her tent. Uh, there is a guard, but um, you know he might be drunk. Yeah, <laughs> they're uh, you know, off over there. They're 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 torturing some uh, some some captives. Uh, we got one one guy hung upside down, giving him the old bone tomahawk treatment. Uh, and she has retired to her uh, to her her chamber's board of uh, you know cutting the legs off of uh, captives. So yeah, I, I mean you're going to do that for so long before. I mean <laughs> you've done three or four, you've done them all, right? Sure. Yeah, I mean you know listen, these uh, anti paladins and uh, black guards and these kind of fallen figures who have gone you know from the light to the darkness not going to be you know they don't they don't keep themselves in the darkness by by doing good things. So and they don't do things uh, in half measures. They're they're full in. <laughs> yeah, they're committed. Um, yeah. So uh, you you come up. You uh, you were able to dispatch the the uh, the guard fairly easily. Well, oh, good. Yeah, there's all this revelry going on. You come up. You give him a good backstab, and uh, eight hit points later, he's uh, he's drugged behind the tent, and you. Th- you throw aside the throw aside the flap and uh and, and walk in uh and she's you know taking off the her armor oh you know, taking off yeah. taking off the the the, the, the heavier you know because she's wearing yeah plate. yeah she's taking off the nobody wants to sleep in plate the, armor of the plate armor and uh she's the tent flies open and she snaps her head up and you see her eyes her eyes are not of this world. They're uh, they're unearthly. Uh, you can see where literally she's crying, uh, like constantly. There's just blood leaking out of out of the bottoms and corners of her eyes, very unnaturally. So, like when she snaps her head of it, some of it actually spatters on the like a nearby skin or on, maybe on the on the, uh, the like a piece of her armor. Uh, the eyes are yellow. They're you know, vivid, bright yellow. And again, very unearthly. Go ahead and make me a save versus, let's see, in first edition, that would be like a gaze attack. So I'll say, we'll say like death magic. I'll say I missed. Oh, unfortunately for Stank, uh, Halantra was given the eyes of a Bodak. A by, Bodak? Uh, by Chernabog as a, as a, as a reward for her service. Uh, Bodax of a death gaze. Oh. So, uh, having surprised her, uh, she strikes you down with with but a glance. Oh. Uh. But let's say, hey, let's say you made your save. Okay. And say... uh, what will it be? You made your save, and you you you, you feel a, a wave of weakness just go over your body for a moment. But you, uh, I know, I have only one chance and, to take the short sword and, and move forward and drive it through her cold, dark heart. Absolutely. Go for it. I roll. Hey, I think I hit. I rolled an eighteen. Yeah, yeah, you absolutely hit. And I Give do damage. three damage. Oh yeah, man, you dig that. Uh, you dig that short, short, sword deep in her side. Um, yeah, I do the Val Kilmer. Uh, the uh, where he's in uh, in Tombstone, where he plays Doc Holliday. So I'm expecting to like to like stare her down as she falls down and dies after stabbing her. <laughs> no, no. Far from uh, falling over from the three points of damage, she uh, seems enraged that you would even uh, you would even try to you know, do something like this. Uh, she reaches out to uh, to grab you. Only at that moment, as you now that you're close to her, you can tell that now she's taken off her um, she's taken off her uh, the upper part of her arm or whatnot. She's just got the padding and whatnot underneath, yeah. and she she was getting ready. 
Um, you notice that across her waist, there's a an odd looking girdle, Ooh. almost like a belt, mm. and it's made from a what looks to be like a kind of a st- like a, a it's soft like a or like leathery like a like a girdle would be, um, but it has almost like a stone sort of like hue to it. Um, you like feel a, like, like you a reach girl out stone giant strength. <laughs> yeah, got that belt of stone giant strength. <laughs> so she's gonna reach out to try to grab you and rip your arm off. Yeah, she's gotta <laughs> catch me though. Yeah, brother, that I don't know if you can see this, but that is a nat twenty. Oh, mm. so uh, yeah, she grabs you with one hand and lifts you off the floor like you were nothing. Reaches over with the other one and pulls your arm off. Hmm. Hmm. Was it the arm with the sword? Oh, why not? Does it? Does it just? Uh, we'll cut. We'll cut to the end here. He's only third level. Uh, she just beats you to death with it. Okay, I didn't know if I was like a gecko where my arm could just detach and I could just uh, then use the other arm. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so yeah, we have uh, four four weird, strange, odd villains um, with that we just barely got into. But uh, but you know, listen, uh, it wasn't a total wash. We were able to. Uh, able to survive one and drive him back into the shadows yeah yeah so it wasn't wasn't a complete failure there you go <laughs> i don't just know a how that failure. i don't know if everyone at home is asleep now just literally dozing off or whatnot, i don't know but, uh, <laughs> but, but you know if they are maybe this would be like you know what people do to them they're tired you're like you know what i've had a stressful day i've had problems unwinding i really need to go to sleep i'll just i'll put on these four epic battles on it <laughs> Listen to the dulcet tones of <laughs> Levi and Jeff. They're going to put you to sleep now yeah. with a count of seven, six, five, four. <laughs> yeah, maybe I yeah. could do maybe I could do a whole series of these and and uh, you know <laughs> get some very sub, sub, subdued folks on. We'll make it happen. But yeah, so you get your you get your four en- encounters. Um, again, these are just. We threw these together literally with no t- nothing, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, you get an idea of the kind of uh, strange villain. Listen, these aren't even the weirdest ones. There's a there's an iron golem walking around with a, a brain in the jar mounted to its shoulders, you know. So you've got this, you know, this giant robotic body and this uh, crazy mad scientist brain floating around, and and you know. The nutrient bath on its shoulders and that's a that's actually a uh, a villain that i wrote for a contest back when third edition was a thing wizards of the coast was was kind of new and they they uh they ran a contest on their website to build interesting villains yeah so i built i built that you had to use just established you know sources from the from what was out at the time so I built that guy and he got into like the, out of all the entries, he got into like, I want to say it was like the final eight before. Uh, Whoa, was the like, elite uh, eight. The elite yeah, eight. Yeah, I mean, I got to the finals, you know, like the, yeah. the final, you know, yeah. the, the U, I got, was in the UFC bracket, you know, and uh, I got knocked out by a. Um, Heath Baker. Ther- <laughs> no, it was an ethereal filter monk. Oh. If I remember correctly, who ended up winning the whole thing. So but I, I, it was fine. I was Yours just is more exciting. Up. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, going, I, I was yeah. I was just happy to be in the food chain, so no, no big deal. <laughs> it was a what bunk one? A what? An ethereal filter. What's I think that's what that's that's the name of the creature. But they're like basically like uh, like thieves that can turn like they're they're ethereal creatures. They can just flit in and out of you know. And it was a monk, so it could just like appear, beat you up, disappear, get behind you, beat you up. That's not interesting. That's just that's just being a jerk GM. But it was an awesome build. You know, it was a great build for a for a, a contest like that. So, uh, right. Yeah. Right. You just realize at that point the the intersection. You're better off with the with the weird crowd, not the uh, the D, normal D and D crowd. Yeah. You know, it was, it was what it was. <laughs> like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna carve my own path. <laughs> you can have your ethereal monks. I'm gonna have my brain in a jar. Uh, ran iron golems and <laughs> I thought it was cool because it's like you know you can do all kinds of kind of crazy mad scientist stuff with that and then you have the whole like um, ghost and machine sort of thing going on too and um, the the motivations and the um, 
the plot hooks I've got for that particular character were, were, were a lot of fun. So he's on the cover of the book. So you'll see him there in a big, big spool up iron golem with a brain floating around. Yeah, I also am doing I'm doing clay golems and write up for the next Gary's appendix. And I realize there's a lot of really fun things you could do with golems. Not not I mean just the traditional clay golem, like even it's like it seemed like everybody just went really weird with the flesh and all these other things, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Golems are interesting in general. I mean, if you want to just talk about this for just a second. Um, yes. Like you look at the flesh golem, that's obviously Frankenstein. If yeah. you look back at the first monster manual, um, the clay golem looks like the golem from the movie Golem, the old silent movie Golem. Um, stone golems are living statues. That's just like a fantasy trope. Right. Out in the middle of nowhere. And then the iron golem is Talos from the Harryhausen, you know, the giant. Uh, oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you've got your your four cinematic, um, you know, creatures. You know, they're they're all four, four cinematic. And then later on when they start, you know, there's bone golems and, you know, nightmare golems and tombstone golems and blood golems, all this stuff. You know, that's all different. You know, that's just riffing off the concept of the golem. But, um, and then when you think about it, like D&D golems don't really have anything in common with, um, you know, the golems of myth. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Like they're more of like automatons or like creations or, you know, mad scientist projects rather than you know, anything from, from myth. Right. Yeah, I did that with a lot of things. It's like, you know, and it's, I guess, hopefully we're all making hay is definitely where they, they've overlooked the, the traditional stuff that's fun. I also was kind of thinking too, they make also not to spill too much. Uh, one of my favorite comics in the days of old was, and I forget with, what the title was, but it was basically Juggernaut versus the Beast. And the whole okay. issue was the Beast trying to outrun the Juggernaut. And the nice. Juggernaut would always smash through. He could he would go through rivers. He could he go through power stations. And the way he he foiled him at the end is for whatever reason, the beast could put on a a rubber mask and look like a human. <laughs> I don't know how he did that, but and so he's at a party and it and the and the juggernaut chases him up the steps. And uh and then the the beast is is cowering. And he comes up to him and then the beast pulls off that mask and he's got the snarl and he jumps and he rips that helmet off of the juggernaut. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's like, oh my goodness. Oh, it's so man. amazing. But I thought, you know, an iron <laughs> golem is being an, an, an unstoppable creature. Like, let's you got low level people. There's a yeah. golem after you. Um, and you cannot run yeah. it, but it's going to catch up. With, it's going to keep walking when you're sleeping. You get on a oh, boat yeah, yeah. across the river or a lake it's going to cross it's going to walk on the bottom it's it will keep going it will be ever present and ever present but it's always there and i thought that's a great idea for a gm to keep players up moving oh no for sure because you can be head an iron golem and it still keeps coming yeah like like the, it doesn't have to have its head to move around it's like an elemental like you can, how are you going to behead an elemental you just yeah it, you, you'd have to have like a vorpal sword or something and cut its legs off and mm -hmm. arms and you, you surround know, yourself with a castle wall, but it just breaks through the wall. I mean, yeah, it's just like no, thinking like a juggernaut. So, yeah, a lot of fun stuff. A lot of fun, a lot of creatures you have, or the four opponents. Very good job, uh, Levi. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of thoughts, especially the eyes of the. Uh, I forget if the eyes were that she had the uh, Bodak. The Bodak. Bodak eyes. Yeah, but you know, you got you got a kind of a, a taste there of. Uh, we didn't really have any. We, we didn't. Uh, for whatever reason, didn't have a didn't come up with one of the lower level ones, but uh, it's a great mongrel man kind of character. That's uh, that's that's really interesting. Um, that I I quite like. So uh, he would have been good. He would have been a good addition, I think. But um, yes, you can use the song Mongol Mongoloid. Uh, you know, mongrel man was a mongrel man. Yeah, I could do mongrel man to mongoloid from Devo. Uh, <laughs> that's a deep cut. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't even know if they call them mongrel men anymore. I, they may have a different name for them. I'm not, I'm not even sure. I have to check that out. But like, I just remember those. You know, they had, like the guy had the crab claw and half yeah. a bugbear part of his. You know, they could they could really just be anything. Uh, and th this this one is uh, the result of a poorly worded wish. So uh... <laughs> let that be a warning, boys and girls. Yeah. If you get a ring of wishes. Be very careful who the GM yeah. is. <laughs> Watch out how you phrase that uh, that that wish to bring everybody in the party back. <laughs> oh. 
good old monkey paw. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, um, yeah, I had a really, really, um, it was a very, cons- like, like, pers- like, like, uh, creatively it was very constructive time um, writing out some of these villains. Uh, you know, and another thing that I, I didn't mention at the, the top of the show is that while there are all these new villains in it, I've included a few like old kind of Planet X favorites. So like there's a fresh write up for the Mummy Bride in there with uh, kind of a whole, like her whole story um and like her motivations and like how to use her outside of jungle team with the mummy bride so if you wanted to transplant that character to someplace else you could do it and i did that for a couple of things like uh there's some crater mutant stuff in there yeah we could take them from helen crater and, and insert them uh, other places and the same with um with one of the kaiju and uh yeah i think um i think people who are, are fans of the previous material We'll get this and be like, oh, well, now I can take these kind of cool like uh, in bosses or villains from other products and I can I can put them in something completely different with minimal like fudging or trying to figure out the connective tissue. Well, and the thing is, yeah, I offered some some randomness to if you want it, like not just make it all the same. Like you, here's different options and ideas. So if you're like, because a lot of times you can see a villain, you're like, I'm not sure how to use it, but you provide different ways of, of approaching that and like, oh, OK. You know, if this thing ends up funding like 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 three million dollars more than it will like way more than I ever uh, thought, I'm gonna go ahead and throw in like ways to uh, for each villain ways to convert them specifically for like OSC and DCC. I think you know how to use those in those systems because they're, they're, those are the systems that I enjoy. But also like with DCC, like you can really. You know, things can that that system is so volatile and so unpredictable, which is a part of its fun, that it can really um, things can really turn or change on a dime. So, um, I think that would be good for for a, a good added bonus for for the, all the people who are backing it. So, would you be you'd be doing that? I'm hoping as a as a separate, not in the book. Are you doing it like as a separate PDF? Um, no, I would just actually just put that in the book. I would just make that just a, you know, another entry, but, um, that's something to consider, you know, if you start, if I start looking at the the page count, as far as like, all right, so how many pages are we going to devote to each villain? You know, can I, could I just, if if I, instead of putting this in the book and not making it a PDF, could I just put a couple more villains in here? If that's the, if that's the trade-off, I would just go with more villains and make that a separate PDF. But, um, yeah, it's a good idea. So something to definitely consider. Hmm. Well, it's exciting. So how long is this Kickstarter going to run? Uh, so it runs a total of 21 days. Uh, I think right now it's at, uh, we're two days in. So another another 19. Yeah, three weeks, I think, works about right. Four, can, four if it, you know, if you can go four weeks and, it, and it's doing great in the middle, it's, it, as long as it keeps funding the middle, it's great. But it's when if you get ever hit a stretch where it doesn't, then you realize I should have shortened this dumb thing up. I've tried, you know, long one, short one. It's the three weeks seems to be the sweet spot for me. Um, some dates and months are better than other dates and months, so it really just depends. Um, but I'm lucky that I have, uh, you know, like a loyal group of backers who a lot of them back project after project. So I'm super. Yeah, aware that I want to make sure that I'm I'm giving them something over what they paid for, you know. Yeah, because I looked at your kick track uh, just I think it was yesterday, and you definitely had a huge surge the first day. And uh, yeah, you, you, you kind of look at how the, those curves look, and you can kind of tell, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like yeah, Levi's yeah. on now. <laughs> I don't follow that stuff nearly as like as much as I should. Like I I like I said a smart businessman would be looking at all the metrics and you know fine tuning it here and here in here but honestly man as long as it funds and I can I have enough to like keep me keep me um in coffee and and donuts until the next one <laughs> it pay make sure everybody gets paid give out into your bonuses I'm pretty happy you know um and again, really just thankful for the the people who return again and again. So um, I want to make sure that they get something good. Like I just, oh, I just got uh, my proof copy for Three Curses for Sister Sarah today, which is a Kickstarter I did a while ago. Yeah. And uh, I'm just so happy that we packed it full of 
way more than what you know we initially said we were going to do it's just it's you know it's one of those jam-packed books that every page has art on it or an illustration yeah it's Some expensive have, it is but man it just uh I'm really happy that I get to turn that out and fans aren't just getting like some like like just some thing that you know that that I could have just thrown out there that we actually were able to to make it look badass. Well, cuz you you I think that's the advantage is if you if you if you kickstart first and then take those funds and you have extra funds you can buy extra art or me yeah. I try and buy everything ahead of time but I got to be very conservative because you know I don't know how it's going to be. So I think the advantage in your situation is, you know, you can use that time after the Kickstarter to evaluate how much funds to be put towards the different parts of it. I buy most of my art up front, to be honest with you, okay. before I ever see a dime. I buy most of the art. Oh, so you already made the decision to buy all that art before you did it? No, but the like, so like, you know, if it say, say your 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 funding goal is two G's and then you but you get seven. You know, all right. Well, I've got my expenses taken care of. Let me put some more of that into the book to make it even look oh. more badass than it did. Yeah, I wouldn't so, do that. <laughs> so I just end up with like, um, like on on that particular um, project, I ended up um, adding. I mean, gosh, probably anywhere from like a dozen to almost two dozen new illustrations yeah that's nice i'm just too i'm too too strong i'm ready to get that printed in the keeping it open just stresses me more than but i think what you're doing is actually it is definitely good and viable it's just myself i'm not wired for that no oh, i hear you man and listen I've, I've got a couple that are open now so like i have to fulfill and I'm really close to fulfilling like the next three. Like they're all like they're all written and they're just at the at you know at various stages in the design process. So it's like we're almost there. It's just a, a matter of well, but that just, was the original intent of Kickstarter. Yeah, I have an idea. You're fun. People are funding that idea, and then you're making it happen. Where with me, it just tends to be more of a marketing. I've already I, the thing's already pretty much done or is done. Um, but but it just does not allow me the flexibility afterwards so i you know it's it's kind of weird but it is what it is no, I, I get that i get that yeah it's just uh so anyway anyway i think we're hitting the, the time space continuum uh, levi <laughs> well thanks for having me dude i really appreciate it it's yeah, always a pleasure the, to talk to you man yeah thanks for the arena of death <laughs> was it a total wash <laughs> no except for poor old uh thun or fight tour oh fight tour <laughs> alas oh well I'll uh, I'll just have a nice uh, have a nice service for him and and uh, that's what arrows of human slaying are for, sir. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> so till next time, Levi. Take care. All right, man. Take care of yourself. Well, thanks, Levi. Well, that was a lot of fun, man. Thanks. Sure. I know that was a bit more like subdued than our normal like <laughs> conversations we have. But, yeah. Um, yeah. I appreciate you using your platform to let me talk about my silly books so yeah i thought this might be kind of a fun way to, to emphasize some some stuff without just being the same just you know going through yeah, the character no, I, get it, man. I, get it. I get it i mean i was on uh rolling bones last night and barely talked about it we we, we got off on this subject about non uh fantasy influences and in rpgs and Ryan was blowing my mind with actually with a few things. I was like, I never even made these connections. Like I thought I was going to have it. I had it all written out, like all this stuff that I was going to talk about. And I just completely went off script and we were got off of talking about, you know, all kinds of strange, like from how Westerns influence modern art, like the old RPGs of, of our, of our youth and war movies and comics and music and how all those kind of, it was, it was a really interesting conversation. It started out kind of like rough because we were both like, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. But it turned into a real conversation and then it was interesting. You know? Yeah. So you just never know sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> well, man, I appreciate it. All righty. Well, you have a good night. I'll probably, I'll be dropping this in two weeks. Yeah, dude. Shoot me the link. Will do. Thanks, buddy. Take care, man. I appreciate it. Bye. You too.